first of all, world growth. Is it a little bit shy of what you were expecting? We saw a little bit of bumps in the last couple of, of months. D does it spell trouble ahead? Yeah, so now I, 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 I like to look through the little bumps over the last couple of months always when I'm doing sort of forecasting because I think we're going to see variation in the data over time. But the global economy overall, I think, is, is healthy. Um, and on a better path than we've seen it for quite some time. Similarly, in the U.S., I mean, we have a very positive outlook in the, in the United States economy as well. So I think that the outlook is actually pretty positive. Are there any kind of data points or any indications or grumbles for certain economies that tightening in Fed policy actually hurts Europe, hurts Asia? So there is a discussion always about, you know, does monetary policy in the U.S. lead and then affect the global economy? And whenever we're doing policy, we do have to take into account interactions between uh, economies. We're in a global economy, after all, and financial markets, of course, are global. Um, but when we're setting monetary policy in the U.S., we use our dual mandate goals as our guide, and we're always going to be setting policy to uh, s support those goals. On the other hand, we also want to be very um, transparent about our policy, and that's, you know, you mentioned the dot plot. I think of those as being communication devices so that we let people know kind of where we're seeing the economy going and what we think appropriate policy will be if the economy evolves as we expect. Of course, there's always potential, you know, risk to the outlook, and the economy may evolve differently, and we'll set our policy appropriately if it does. When does inflation really pick up? And when so, does it start following the, the labor market again? Yeah, exactly. So inflation has been shy of 2% for quite a while. We have seen an acceleration. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if we see um, the near-term inflation readings go higher. Just for one thing, you know, we do have those um, cell phone service plans that you were talking about just a moment ago, um, dropping out of some of the calculations. We also see commodity prices going up. <clears throat> but when the Fed is thinking about our goal, dual mandate goal and inflation 2 percent, of course we're thinking about it on a sustained basis, that we're, we're going to look through these transitory movements and look at where inflation is going. My own forecast is that we'll see inflation be at 2 percent on a sustained bas basis over the next one to two years. Dr. Mester, good morning. Uh, Tom Keene in New York. I want to talk to you about the Cleveland Fed's historic ability to measure inflation. When are we going to get back to measuring top-line inflation? That's the largest amount of mail I get from people in every Fed district. They don't get the idea of core inflation. You've led on this with the Cleveland Fed CPI. When do we get back to actually measuring the inflation? our viewers and listeners uh, live with every day? So we do have our goal in terms of top line inflation, headline inflation. <clears throat> but in order to be able to forecast inflation, we have to look at a variety of different measures of inflation. And some of the core measures, as you say, the ones that drop out food and energy prices, the Cleveland Fed's own median CPI uh, measure that you mentioned earlier, um, the trim mean measures of inflation, we look at those because they give us perhaps a better sense of the underlying trend in inflation. But nonetheless, it is the headline inflation number that we're, we're targeting, and that's, that's how we framed our goal. We look at the other ones because it helps us forecast inflation. When I look, Dr. Mester, at your geography, western Pennsylvania, all of Ohio, eastern Kentucky, and a little bit of West Virginia as well, what I see in the Cleveland Fed is a scream for a manufacturing re renaissance. How do we do little Switzerland in the Cleveland Federal Reserve System geography? How do we boost real, tangible manufacturing? So there is a lot of innovative things going on in the district in terms of manufacturing. As you just said, you know, we've moved our economy in the district, fourth district, from one that was very dependent on manufacturing to one that is still more dependent on manufacturing than the average part of the nation, but nonetheless is also very heavily in, um, in education and also medical. So we've transformed the, the economy in the district to one that is a little bit more diversified, 
but we do have some technological innovation going on in the manufacturing space, and we have a lot of programs where we're working with, um, where the, the uh, businesses are working with um, community college and other training programs to actually train uh, workers for those new types of manufacturing jobs. Uh, Dr. Mester, why are you so relaxed about inflation not behaving like it should when, it, when you look at the uh, correlation between U.S. employment and inflation? So, you know, a lot of what's going on, I think, in um, the inflation numbers is that we had this huge, huge recession. And, you know, in some sense, it's a surprise that inflation didn't even go lower during the Great Recession. And the reason I think it didn't is because we did have very well anchored inflation expectations and people understood that the Fed would do what <clears> it takes to bring inflation back to our goal. Here, I think we're in the same kind of situation in that we see that inflation expectations are fairly well anchored. And so I think that's also helping in terms of keeping inflation at our goal. I do believe that we're going to get back to 2% on a sustained basis over the next year, year or so. And I do think that you know, we might see some variation in the numbers over time. It, it may go above 2% for a time. But that doesn't necessarily mean that we're in a shooting off period where inflation is going to take off. I don't see that happening. I think it's very going to be a gradual process. And there, therefore, the Fed can stay on our gradual upper path of interest rates and you know, basically meet both parts of our mandate. But so why does this labor market, labor environment, not force wages up by itself? So if you look at models, that, and some Cleveland staff research actually does this, looks at sort of what are the indicators of wage growth, you can explain. It's not a mystery if you think about low productivity growth, which we've had over this expansion, 1% as opposed to the usual 2 to 2 and a half, 2 and 3 quarters percent in other expansions the low inflation rate and also uh, what, you know, conditions in, in the labor market. <laughs> that explains the wage growth that we've seen. We've, we've been hearing from a lot of our firms in our district that they are raising wages in order to attract workers. I think it's a matter of time that we'll see more of that feed through into the uh, like ECI measures of wages. We're already seeing that a little bit. I think that'll continue. Dr. Mester, two mathy questions, if we can do, to keep up with the mathematician from Barnard uh, as, as best we can. I want to know what you've learned about ex ante and ex post monetary policy. You've been doing this for years. You've provided leadership on this idea of a Fed that's trying to get out front of the data. Is that possible? Or by definition, is it an ex post Fed? Is it a Fed that has to wait to see the data? Well, we always look at the data. There's no doubt about our, our, our modus operandi is we're going to take on board the data. But we're also always setting policy according to what our outlook is. So our median run outlook for the economy is what guides sort of our decisions on policy. So it's, a, you know, it's both. The data informs our outlook. And the outlook then informs what we think of as appropriate monetary policy. So we are out in front. But we're taking on board current data because it's going to tell us something about whether we need yeah. to change our outlook or whether our outlook is on, you know, on track or not. Uh, Dr. Mester, I was talking with my colleague Carl Riccadonna. He's focused on the balance sheet challenges the Federal Reserve System has and, frankly, all central banks have. Chairman Bernanke told me he's really not concerned with the balance sheet roll-off that we're going to see. What observations will you look for to tell you it's going smoothly? Or far more importantly, how will you measure that the balance sheet wind-up is going poorly? What factors will you try to observe? So what I look at is whether the market's absorbing um, the, the, the runoff, um, and also what is happening on the long end of the bond market. So remember, we bought the long-term assets um, to put downward pressure on the long rate. Um, so far, the, the, you know, we haven't seen any disruption in the market at all. Um, and that has been running in the background, um, which is kind of how we planned it when we put out our normalization plan. I'll have to look, you know, continue to monitor to make sure that um, markets are absorbing um, the, 
the bonds and also to make sure that we don't see um, sharp changes in the long end of the bond market. But so far, so good. Um, Loretta Mester, can anyone reasonably expect the Fed, but also the ECB, to be able to avoid large-scale asset purchases again, um, given the long-term dynamics, actually holding out potential growth, and also holding out down you know, the neutral interest rate? So that was actually a topic in our earlier session here at the conference. Um, you know, we, I think those, of, uh, those purchases as being something you do when you get into a situation where you run out of room uh, with interest rates. The fact that if we are in a world where um, the equilibrium interest rate is lower um, than it's been and is going to continue to be low, then that raises the possibility that we'll be at the zero lower bound again. And then we might have to use the asset purchase uh, tool. I think we've learned how to use it um, in an effective way over the past cycle. But there is a whole other discussion going on about, you know, should we be thinking about our framework? And it, how does the fact that maybe we're in a lower equilibrium interest rate world mean for our framework for doing monetary policy? So my personal belief is that, you know, inflation targeting has served um, the FOMC well. But I do think we owe it to ourselves and to the public to look at these alternative frameworks and see whether there is some thing we can learn from them and perhaps... Uh, amend our framework to make it more effective. Um, Laura Mester, some of your peers, some of your colleagues have asked the Board of Governors to actually raise the counter-cyclical capital buffer for large banks. Mm -hmm. Do you agree they should do that? So at this point, I don't foresee that um, we are in a situation where we need to use that tool. However, um, I do think that the longer we go um, with interest rates very low and there's a potential that we would have to respond. So again, I think there is um, a case for you know monitoring very carefully, given where we are in the cycle and given where interest rates are. I still think interest rates are accommodative, um, and then being you know willing to use that tool um, to build up capital buffers in good times so they can be used in bad times.